Good afternoon, and welcome to ID Squared, the interdependency of industrial design and interior architecture. Today, we have, this is brought to you by the Business and Institutional Furniture Manufacturers Association, better known as BIFMA, and the International Federation of Interior Architects and Designers, better known as IFI. I'm John Rouse, the former publisher of Contract Magazine and founder of my firm, Perception Studio. In the next hour, we hope to explore how the two disciplines work together to enhance the built environment and influence the human experience. Now, please welcome your hosts, Deirdre Jimenez, President and CEO of BIFMA, and Sashi Khan, President and CEO of IFI. Those of you who know me, you've heard me speak about the symbiotic relationship between furnishings and their environment. While the interior design creates the space, the furnishings serve to activate it, both working in harmony to create the human experience. This relationship goes back to the beginnings of civilization. I'm honored here to be with Sashi. We first started imagining this session last year when we met at Neocon. Through a number of different events, our conversations just continued as we found more and more in common, both designers, architects, leading national, international associations, and both with a passion to raise that conversation around design. So when this opportunity presented itself, we thought it was a great time to bring industrial designers who design the furniture products that are used in human spaces with interior designers to let them test this hypothesis to see if the symbiotic relationship resonates with them and how they see it manifest itself in their work. Thank you. That was a year ago already. That's unbelievable, Deirdre. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to find kindredness in you, Deirdre, and in BIFMA. And to find our shared connections, which was a very, very interesting and fantastic um, finding. I think I can speak for both of us that through the development of this program, our organizations have found even more commonality in our missions. As the only federation and world voice for interiors, IFI, the International Federation of Interior Architects and Designers, is foundationally inclusive and concerned with equitable exchange through collaborative efforts. Working closely with you and BIFMA, and of course, Neocon, is a reminder for us of the value of finding synergies for deeper understanding and knowledge building that helps us all to improve life quality through and by design. Celebrating IFI's 60th anniversary this year, working with close to some 100 nations across the world, our biggest goal at IFI is to build a world community of shared design and business intelligence to promote higher standards of excellence and to fundamentally unite through our applied initiatives such as these. Finding the right facilitator and panelists for today for today's conversation took some very careful curation. And I would like to acknowledge John Rouse, IFI ambassador extraordinaire, and partner at Perception Studio, and Jennifer Womack, director of BIFMA's Outreach and Learning, for their time and dedication to developing this program. I also want to extend advanced thanks to our moderator, Carl, and panelists, thank you so much, um, for their leadership in the field and willingness to share their valuable insights with us today. But thanks to each of you for joining us. Now I'd like to invite back our Master of Ceremonies, John Rouse, to lead us through the program. Thank you. Now, it is my immense pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Carl Gustav Magnuson, as principal of his firm, 
CGM Design. Carl is regarded as one of today's most acclaimed industrial designers. He was born in Sweden, educated and trained as an architect, and after working with Ray and Charles Eames, he joined Knoll, where he forged a nearly three-decade career as director of design, overseeing the design of nearly 100 products. Since founding New York-based CGM Design in 2005, his clients have included Spinnybeck, Knoll, Technion, Mean Camper, BMW, and the MoMA Design Store. He has been honored with over 45 awards, including the 2012 Design Legend Award from Contract Magazine. Please welcome Carl Magnuson. John, thank you very much for giving me the honor of moderating this event and to meet professional friends and esteemed panelists. And thank you to BIFMA and IFI for making this possible. If time permits, we've scheduled a Q&A for the end and hope you'll remain for the extra discussion. First, I would like to introduce the panelists from your left to right. Martin Lesiak, CEO and founding partner of Inocad Graz Austria. Beautiful presentation of materials, I think. And Julie Michaels, Senior Associate Principal and Design Leader, SOM Chicago. And Alessandra Munge, Founder and Design Director of Studio Munge Toronto. And Andre Sandefer, Director of Craft, Ali Sandefer, Grand Rapids. Let's have a conversation about the interdependence of interior architecture and industrial design today. Interior architecture is usually site-specific, whereas industrial design, in particular furniture, can be use universally applied to any site. With that in mind, I'd like to pose some questions to our panelists. How can interior architecture collaborate to create products and environments that support each other and client solutions. Julie, would you like to take this one? Oh, do I have a choice? No, I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to... No. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the and, price is right or yeah. something like that. <laughs> Before I start, I do want to say thank you to you for, um, for moderating us and to BIFMA and IFI for having us all as panelists today. I think it's great to hear that we were uh, your fir first choice to realize that dream and that vision that you guys had a year ago to do this, and so congratulations to you. Um, getting to the question of how interior designers and, and industrial designers can collaborate, I think it's an important collaboration, and I think Deidre said it well in her introduction, um, that you know the, the interior architecture creates the space and the furniture activates the space. And I think that looking at um, solving a problem and, and looking at it through that lens and not necessarily through the lens of just a silo of a product type is something that will really help to strengthen those collaborations. I would say, backing up, like SOM has a very strong legacy in um, thinking about design holistically and it's been very important throughout our legacy and it's something that we continue with um, our research and innovation group now, we have two industrial designers on staff that support us out of Los Angeles. And I think every project we've worked on has something custom that's born out of this intersection of looking at the problem holistically that we're trying to solve, whether it's a um, culture or the way we're trying to activate space or brand or just there's something that we discover along the way that creates a new product or a new object out of that. And so it's, um, it's a really exciting collaboration, one that's important, and I would say with spaces being um, oftentimes more open than they've been in the past also, furniture becomes a really important actor in the space in terms of uh, completing that vision and really being one with the, the architectural solution. Yeah, great. Martin, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to underline this, uh, what Julie just said, uh, and also include architecture to the to this dream we are at of of interiors, products, and, and the space itself, and the building architecture. As we, uh, in our studio, we live this holi holistic approach, mm -hmm. because besides Inokat architecture, that does architecture and interior design, we, we also run, together with Anastasia, my wife, the product design studio 39 since 10 years, where we wanted to professionalize this 
what you just said, that you, I mean, we all know that we develop hundreds and hundreds of prototypes as architects and interior <laughs> designers. And at, at one point, um, we thought it, it's really helpful to, to see also the side of the serial product and to, if, if someone turns out relevant, to bring it also to other people yeah, and not right. to just to the client. And so I think it all belongs together because when you, when you look to the past, to the old masters of the past and even the, the, um, the giants of modernism like, mm -hmm. like Denise and, 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 Le, uh, and Corbusier, they didn't separate. They didn't separate architecture and theory design. And I, I, I feel this is the right way. Even uh, not one person needs to know everything because you work collaborative anyway. And so, but I think we should be more and more aware that this separation is a quality of, let's say, of the past decades, but was not the thousands and thousands of years before. Yeah. Well said. How can product and interior design work together to influence diversity, equity, and inclusion in a client's organization. Alessandro, your thoughts, please. Yeah, interesting question in terms of thinking about what is relevant today and what's sort of the hot topics of this sort of subject matter. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm really proud of the fact that in our studio, it already exists organically in our mm -hmm. studio. Like, we have, we live in Toronto and Canada, for those of you who don't know, and our focus is always around uh, hospitality and residential work. And if you come to our studio, you know, there's no two faces alike. <laughs> we have this beautiful multicultural studio of individuals that are just gorgeous individual people in our, in our office as a result of that. And, and that comes through in our work organically. So we often don't even think about these mm -hmm. things, but it's amazing to see that the results of the work mm -hmm. showcase that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's amazing. I, I, don't, I haven't really necessarily grown up from a generation that was so specifically focused on that. And so when, when I get our conversations in our studio about this question, I say, well, it kind of happens whether you realize it or not. Now, how do we control it in hospitality? without even realizing it? Well, I believe in the power of people. Mm -hmm. I believe in the power of people in design, and, it, and I think that brings forward an emotion as a result of that. Um, and so by doing that, we make sure that when we're space planning, I'm okay with putting a chair a little closer to someone that, God forbid, we have a, a little moment where we touch each other and we can have a conversation, and I don't care about your color or your race or any of that. Mm -hmm. I just care about you as an individual, and we can have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation. Yeah. So, our planning and our projects tend to do that just organically. Yeah. So, um, and it is through space and furniture as part of this whole conversation. And yeah. I too, like the many of the panelists here today, have created a studio where we have four industrial designers and we're very specific about um, the shape and the form and, and uh, where we have to create custom pieces. Mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, we will certainly collaborate with suppliers like the ones in this building today uh, to also infuse the pieces, so it's a mix of. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's yeah. yeah. Very good. Andre, what are your thoughts, please? Uh, thank you, uh, John, for the introduction. Um, one quick note, I originally from Grand Rapids, but my studio is in, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, so it kind of brings up a really heavy question, especially being a black designer, as far as, um, design and as it relates to being in included in, in certain conversations. So for me, I look at it as a product, like a product is a table, but also people are just as important in, in, in that conversation. So in order to create sort of inclusive and diverse environments, we need to you know, have the people represent that as well. So the authors of the furniture, the authors of interior designer, should represent that as well, whether it's color, um, age, or disability, or what have you. What is the impact of ergonomics for useful user wellness in the post-COVID environments where associates may continue to work in a variety of spaces? Julie, what do you think? I think there's, um, it's a really good question. There's a lot of study and a lot of thought around what happened during COVID. It, it forced people to sort of reckon with how they work and what's the best way to do that when we were all unexpectedly finding ourselves at home. Um, I think, you know, pre-COVID, pre we were all on the, like, sitting is the new smoking bandwagon and, like, 
what do we do about sit stand and then everybody standing all day was becoming an issue and so like I think ergonomics have really been front of mind for a long time and this really kind of blew that up and like maybe instead of thinking about sit stand we're thinking about sit sit different like maybe there's other postures and comfort that people found at home conversely I think people also found a, an appreciation for good quality furniture mm -hmm. that they have in their offices. And I think it's finding sort of a blend between those two things to support those different postures. But like my living room couch is great, but it was not comfortable for you know any given amount of time throughout the day. Um, I think maybe it spurred a movement. I see a lot of like less tectonic, cleaner looking task chairs coming out. Maybe people didn't wanna, you know, started to pay more attention to those things when they had to bring them into their homes yeah. as well. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting was people are more, much more aware of air quality. And you might ask how furniture impacts air quality, but we are, our research initiative at SOM actually did a um, very in-depth study with a major furniture manufacturer on how furniture, right, if that's part of our interior architecture, impacts airflow, and it can actually inhibit or um, promote good airflow throughout a space and getting fresh air and all those things. But at the same time, what we realized from that is people didn't want to see the solution to the problem because it reminds you of the problem, yeah. right? So it's finding this delicate balance between solving the problems we're trying to solve for ergonomics, for health, but doing it in a way that's not calling specific attention to it, we're still creating beautiful, elegant furniture. Very good. Mark? Um, I think the consciousness uh, for health and well-being in the working environment is, is increasing uh, a lot nowadays, and it's not a, only about economics, it's also about acoustics, about social connectivity, about stress reduction, and um, when we talk about ergonomics, I mean ergonomics already, uh, to, to, to think about ergonomics already starts that you keep people moving in, in, the, in the best case back to the office again, because there you have all the possibilities to offer a, a diversity of, of qualities that they can never find at home. And, and we, we, we now office projects, we try to inco uh, incorporate uh, the possibility for different postures, uh, besides sitting and standing, also leaning. The most relaxing posture for the back is the the angle of 135 degrees between legs and, and the body. It's yep. not. It's not this. Yeah. It's not that. And <laughs> so, but also, and and this possibility for it's leaning and have have le uh, leaning meeting <laughs> possibilities or working possibilities or even swinging like the product we designed for passive space where you mm -hmm. balance on, on a board. Uh, this helps a lot, you know, to, to, to um, enhance health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah. And I, well, sorry, I was just gonna build on that real quick. And I think you touched on this in your response to Alessandro as well, is thinking about diversity of age in the workplace now as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of different ergonomic needs, so it's definitely not one size fits all. And I yeah. think that diversity will help as that continues to be the case as more generations are in the workplace than mm. we've had before and I think that'll help provide flexibility and future proof. And, and keep people moving. Don't yeah. Cent yeah. Uh, centralize everything, you know, yeah. that people don't, they, 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 they should go, they should leave the workplace. The, the best employees are not that they sit the, uh, the most time on their chair. No? So this really leads us easily into, there's a lot of talk about back to work in the office. How do we make office more attractive for creative interaction and innovation? Martin, again, your thoughts. Um, yes, man, as mentioned before, nowadays it's really important to create healthy and in inspiring mm -hmm. uh, workplaces and um, where people can experience this this benefit of, of, of a good designed uh, space that enhances different qualities like social connectivity or, or even to, to enable you to express your creativity. But when we talk specifically about uh, innovation and, and creativity, I think 
um, we in our workplace strategy we talk um, or we, we differentiate between collaborative spaces, stimulating spaces, spaces, playful spaces and mm -hmm. reflective spaces. Mm -hmm. And it's scientifically um, proved and, and explored that when, when you um, offer people the possibility to sh shift between these qualities in a dance like um, choreography, that this uh, really fosters innovation and, and, and creativity. Yeah, well said. Alessandro? I could not agree more. I, I hope if my staff is listening to this, just they don't give me shit about this whole thing, but <laughs> because I am definitely pro uh, back in the studio uh, to collaborate. Because our, our, look, we are a small studio and um, ours, our, our work tends to be definitely based more emotively. And as a result of that, I need human spirit around me in order to create these spaces. And if the human space if people are not there, if the spirit's not there, then how do you create? Um, and I saw this, you know, and I realized too that like most of our projects are anywhere from three to five years. So um, it sounds all good for you to work from home, but let's see what the results of the projects are in three to five years. We don't know just yet. We don't know. And so my concern when I start to see this is I saw people getting a little bit you know, maybe uh, some went through different stages of depression and all that. And I said, let's just get people back in yeah. because I miss them. I really do. I miss them. I love collaborating with them. Yeah. And I also see the way we had set up our studio like 10 years ago was based on team structure where no matter what happens, the minute you turn your chair, you're going to be in touch with someone. Right. We refused to do a studio where it was all lined up where everybody had three feet and you just kind of had rows and rows and rows of assembly lines. And that process doesn't align for our studio being so boutique in which it is, where it's totally reliant on each other. So very much pro like you, much more collaborative studio. Let's get people to create energy within the studio so that we get better product as a result of that. Sure. Well, how can product and interior design increase worker satisfaction and productivity in light of the increased popularity of virtual meetings, both internal and external? Andrew, Andrew? I think that's like the million dollar questions for a lot of CEOs, right? It's like, how do you solve the problem of, of creating a space that um, will then enhance productivity, but also excite people? I think what you're touching on is now, you know, a lot of folks are remote and by themselves, and it's really hard to have an, an engaged conversation because, you know, so many people are so used to Zoom. I had a client the other day, I was like, how about we just get on the phone call, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like trying to understand how do you engage with people again, it, it, and that will create this sort of excitement to, to work, right? <clears throat> but also just thinking about, you know, I also design, but I also make. So I'm very, you know, I like to draw on the computer, but at the same time, I like to make my little, like what I call dollhouse models um, by hand, not even by a 3D printer just so I can understand like, how does the material feel? What does it smell like? And you know, that is what gets me excited about making furniture. And I think when folks have the ability to sort of tap into what gets you excited about architecture, you know, it's understanding how people experience space, interiors, how people you know, interact with furniture. So I think it's all related, you know, hence the, the, the larger conversation, but I think people really need to be um, sort of activated, right? Sure. Yeah. Julie, what do you think? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a very specific, oops, I'm going to give a very specific, specific example and call out one of my colleagues on how she used furniture in a collaborative way to stop me from getting past her desk because <laughs> she had been trying to get a hold of me all day to ask when we could meet. And so I couldn't get out of our row until I answered her question. So this is a good way to use furniture to, <laughs> to collaborate. Um, thank you, Sharon. That's and um, I think that it, you know, it goes back a little bit to what I mentioned earlier. I think the quality of the furniture, I think, has maybe a newfound appreciation. And, and I think making the space exciting is certainly important to entice people to want to come back to find focus and to find their colleagues both. Um, and I feel like I had something else I wanted to add there, but um, I, you know, I think it's just continuing to really think, 
closely about what it is that people are coming there for, right? right. We, we actually asked ourselves a question, like as it was still when COVID was going on and we were still at home and everything was Zoom and Teams and whatever, we're like, what is the table, what is the conference table even for anymore? Yeah. And we're like, well, it's for my coffee and my water and my laptop and my phone, right? And it, right. so it's basically just a big charger and cup holder. Mm. Right. But it made us, you know, thinking about those kinds of edge cases, if you will, or things that we want to push the boundaries on, like what, sure. what's a conference table anymore? Yeah. Well said. What are the factors, what other factors are critical to design solutions in both interior and industrial uh, design? Martin? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, as, as these things are not separated and as, as mentioned before, I also want to include architecture. Um, we all should share the same goal to, to put basic human needs back center mm -hmm. and make the world a better place. And mm -hmm. I think this is um, what unites us all. And more important than this, um, I think we should be aware and embrace our responsibility if, as creatives because uh, the, the, the act of creation um, uses resources of our planet and common goods uh, as well. And we shape our environment and the behavior. So we should be aware that our responsibility goes far beyond the clients and the market needs. Yeah. Thank you. Andre? I would say so definitely. Um, Having the ability to solve a problem um, is, is, you know, coming from the designer and maker. One of the products that I mean, you mentioned the, the conference table, and so a lot of new products sort of came from, you know, people being remote and, and things like that. So for me, I think being able to solve a problem um, is very critical in that sort of, um, you know you know, thinking about products and, and how it relates to people. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, there are many interior and industrial designer professionals trained in one profession who also, or exclusively, practice in another one. What makes this successful, Alessandro? Mm. Well, you're laughing. I haven't even answered the question. <laughs> 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 um, I'll tell you, I, for, f that's, a, that's a great question because what I found, and I don't know if it's a function of age as I'm getting older and older in this business, but I like control of our, of our work. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that the, when we script a narrative around the project, uh, we don't have like-minded people, <coughs> then you tend to like take off in different directions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, as a result of that, I, I brought in industrial designers because I wanted to control furnishings. And, mm -hmm. you know, and we have architects as well, and we have um, different disciplines, marketing disciplines, so we can create this narrative and then just holistically bring the solution to our clients and so that people can enjoy it the way we'd imagine it. So when they're falling within our spaces, you're living the narrative for the minute that you're there or the hours that you're there. And then when you're gone, well, you can go live other narratives, right? Especially when it comes to restaurant designs, it's just mm -hmm. our focus is hospitality and residential, so we tend to control it within those environments. They're not like large, large scale corporate offices and stuff like that. So, right. um, so as a result of that, we, we wanted to, ha we, we actually you know, seek that, that more disciplines in our yeah. studios. So yeah. Um, so yeah, it was great, right. it works out great for us. What do you think, Martin? Uh, well, Alessandro has the control freak approach. <laughs> <laughs> well, so do you. What, 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 what should I say? <laughs> I mean, I'm a trained architect and soccer player working also in the fields of interior design, product design, and sound design. What makes this successful? I don't know. Maybe the... <laughs> maybe the fresh and, and unprepossessed approach and the talent to find mm -hmm. people who want to work with me. <laughs> yeah. So what is the role of craft and design of spaces today? Andre? That's a very good question. And for me, I kind of separate craft and space because I also want to put furniture in there as well. Um, for me, craft is about longevity. You know, Julie mentioned before about, you know, 
during COVID, a lot of people experience their furniture at home and they're like, you know what, this couch isn't that good or my table isn't that good or wow, I really like that table, but you know, it, it doesn't work, right? And so for me, I look at craft as having the ability to um, have longevity, but also just something that's really sort of um, tuned to details, right? Like details are so important when you think of craft. And so as it relates to space, you know, it's very similar, right? Like you, you know, you paint a, a wall a certain color to, in, you know, create a certain environment. So I think it's also just paying attention to details, but also having the right intention. Well said. <laughs>